So good evening everybody and welcome to another session of Interfaith Activity. And befitting for today, I'd like to just, uh, we're an Interfaith Forum, so today I'd like to have a one minute silence to remember all the people that have lost <coughs> lives around the world, past and present, and made <coughs> present is in the Middle East. So I'd like to suggest we hold a one minute silence for the people that have lost their lives. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll set out silent prayers and silent thoughts. So, thank you all for attending, and very warm welcome to our speakers once again. Uh, my name is Tariq Mahmood. I'm the Vice Chair of this organization, Havering Islamic Center, and uh, there will be an interface discussion today on our faith perspective on God. How do we view our God? Uh, where we will be hearing from the different faith leaders. So these are our experts, so we will listen to them and understand their point of view so that we uh, understand each other. Uh, we will then conclude with an interactive question and answer session. <coughs> so John is our first speaker, John Lester. He's a Baha'i representative and a long-standing chairman of the Havering Interfaith Forum. Let's give a warm hand to John Lester. Hi, well, uh, it's a great pleasure to do this, especially today, because today is actually a Baha'i holy day. It celebrates the birthday of Baha'u'llah. So I'm missing a meeting to, do, to celebrate that, to be here. It's interesting to talk about something you know very little about. Baha'u'llah says, No mind or heart, however keen or pure, can ever fathom the mystery of he who is the day soul of truth, who is the invisible and unknowable essence. So, what we're talking about is an unknowable essence. The essence of God is unknowable. Our minds cannot possibly comprehend um, the Creator, who has been forever and will be forever, never started, never finished. How can we possibly comprehend that? So, how do we do it? Again, what my heart tells us. In the Old Testament we read that God said, let's make man in our own image. The sacred words show that man is made in God's image, yet the essence of God is incomprehensible to the human mind. For the finite understanding cannot be applied to this infinite mystery. God contains all. He cannot be contained. That which contains is superior to that which is contained. The whole is greater than its parts. Things which are understood by men cannot be outside their capacity for understanding. So it is impossible for the heart of man to comprehend the nature of the majesty of God. Our imagination can only picture that which is able to create. The power of the understanding differs in degree in the various kingdoms of creation. The mineral, vegetable and animal realms are each incapable of understanding any creation beyond their own. The mineral cannot imagine the growing power of the plant. The tree cannot understand the power of movement in the animal, neither can it comprehend what it would mean to possess sight, hearing, or the sense of smell. These all belong to the physical creation. Man also shares in this creation, but it is not possible for either of the lower kingdoms to understand that which takes place in the mind of man. The animal cannot realize the intelligence of a human being, he only knows that which is perceived by his animal senses. He cannot imagine anything in the abstract. An animal, could not, an animal could not learn that the world is round, that the earth revolves around the sun, or the construction of the electric telegraph. These things are only possible to man. Man is the highest work of creation, the nearest to God of all creatures. All superior kingdoms are incomprehensible to the inferior. <coughs> How therefore could it be possible that the creature man should understand the almighty creator of all. So we're talking to say about something we're not too sure about. So the lower <coughs> cannot understand the higher. 
When we look at the worlds and the souls, we see wonderful signs of the divine perfections, which are, sorry, that's from one. Um, yes, the plants, yeah, that's virtually saying the same thing, so I don't need to say that again. The lower kingdoms cannot comprehend the higher ones. So, in that case, how do we know about God? Well, the answer is, O Salmon, the door of the knowledge of the ancient being hath ever been and will continue forever to be closed in the face of men. No man's understanding shall ever gain access unto his holy court. As a token of his mercy, however, and as a proof of his loving kindness, he hath manifested unto men the day stars of his divine guidance, the symbols of his divine unity, and hath ordained the knowledge of these sanctified beings to be identical with the knowledge of his own self. Whoso recognizeth them hath recognized God. Whoso hearkens to their call hath hearkened to the voice of God. Whoso testifieth to the truth of their revelation hath testified to the truth of God himself. Whoso turneth away from them hath turned away from God. Whoso disbelieveth in them hath disbelieved in God. Every one of them is the way of God that connecteth this world with the realms above and the standard of his truth unto everyone in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. They are the manifestations of God amidst men, the evidences of his truth, and signs of his glory. Paul is talking about the founders of the great religions. We know, therefore, through what we call manifestations of God. These are the founders of the great religions who manifest the attributes of God. We never understand the essence but we can know the attributes. It's a bit like the sun. The sun shines, we have a perfect mirror. The manifestation of God is a perfect mirror. The sun shines on the mirror, and we look at the mirror and we say, that is the sun. All the attributes of the sun are in that mirror. But it's not true to say that the sun is no longer there and it's in the mirror. Um, it's rather that it's, it's reflection of the, the, the sun's attributes in the mirror, the mirror, the perfect reflection of the attributes of the sun. If it be said that the mirrors are the manifestations of the sun and the dawning places of the rising star, this does not mean that the sun has descended from the height of its sanctity and incorporated in the mirror, nor that the unlimited reality is limited to this place of appearance. So, yes, it's uh, the sun and the mirror. It's a, it's a sort of analogy. The rays and the sun, if you like, are the Holy Spirit. So we know the attributes of God. We know there are, I think in some cultures, something like 99 titles for God or more. Uh, these are the attributes of God. Love, mercy, justice, and so on. These are all the, the, the ways we know God. By the manifestation of God, by the way they perform, by the way they behave. They, you, want to know, you want to know God, you look at the manifestation of God. If you're a Christian, you look at Christ. If you're a Muslim, you look at Muhammad. If you're Baha'i, you look at Baha'u'llah. You say, yes, this is, this is what God is like. But it's what he's like attributes. It's not the essence. The essence of God has not descended down to the heavens. So, the whole idea of, of a God it is starts thinking about an afterlife. Without God, there's no afterlife. So what is the afterlife then? Well, it's a matter of heaven is being close to God and hell is being remote from God. We do not believe that there are two separate places because human beings are neither one thing or the other. It's not, a, it's not a, an exam where 51% is a pass mark and 49% and is a failure all part of that sort of thing. <laughs> but, so what are the, the... The rewards of the other world are peace, the spiritual graces, the various spiritual gifts in the kingdom of God, the gaining of the desires of the heart and the soul, and the meeting of God in the world of eternity. In the same way, the punishments of the other world, that is to say, the torments of the other world, consist in being deprived of the special divine blessings and the absolute bounties and falling in the lowest degrees of existence. So, heaven is being close to God, and recognizing God. Hell is being 
remote from God, a long way away from God. That is getting closer and closer to him. You never quite make it, of course, but you get closer to God. Because the idea is that it is not, nothing is still, nothing is stasis. Nothing stands still. Even in the next world, we progress. We progress. And uh, Amphibaha says in one stage, encouraging, it is even possible that the condition of those who have died in sin and unbelief may become changed. That is to say, they may become the object of pardon through the bounty of God, not through his justice. For bounty is giving without desert, and justice is giving what is deserved. As we have power to pray for these souls here, so likewise we should possess the same power in the other world, which is the kingdom of God. Are not all the people in that world the creatures of God? Therefore in that world also they can make progress. As here they conceive light by their supplications, there also they complete for forgiveness and receive light through entreaties and supplications. So it's a matter of how close to God you get. Unknowable essence. And each time you're progressing slowly closer, if you're a long way away, that's what's excited as hell, you've got farther to go, and all progress is up to the bounty of God. And this is the, this is the spiritual womb, if you like, where we're gathering up our, our arms and our spiritual arms and legs. This is where we can, as it were, do it ourselves. So we go into the next world complete with all our faculties, except our spiritual faculties. If we don't do that, if we do all the wrong things, then we go in um, maimed, uh, incomplete, disabled, and it's uh, up to the bounty of God whether we progress. So, what I've just said has a particular implication, because if there's no, if hell is not a separate place, if hell is simply remoteness from God, and at the bounty of God you can move forward, because let's face it, we're talking of God, an unknowable essence. Uh, an omnipotent essence, uh, then clearly if God chooses to advance someone, then God does that, um, what is the devil? And what Baha'u'llah says, he talks of the Satan of self. The devil is your ego. The thing that tells you you are special. You are more important than other people. For what you want, others must suffer. That's the devil. Let your vision be world embracing rather than confined to your own self, says Baha'u'llah. And elsewhere he says that those who enjoy near access to God have forgotten the concept of I. They have lost, they have lost the idea of self. And if you think of your life of moments of absolute supreme joy, you will realise that at that moment you had forgotten yourself. So, do we capping them? God is an unknowable essence. We can't really understand the essence of God. Uh, someone, that, uh, someone, I say, um, we call him Father, but masculinity is a limitation. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly what he is. Someone who has always existed. It's always existed from the, well, <coughs> time didn't begin. God is there, God has been always. Our minds cannot comprehend that, but it's an obvious fact. And we know of God through the manifestations of God, who show us how all the attributes of God, and that's our goal, is to try and get close to that, to do, do anything we can to help other people and obey what we're told to do, etc., etc. And if we manage to do that, then we can go to then in the next world, we'll we further up the chain, getting closer to God, and if we deal with the rotten things and do rotten mean things and kill a lot of people and so on, then we'll be very distant from God, and uh, any advancement is up to the bounty of God. And that's what hell is, being remote from God, depending on his bounty and his progress. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your starting the evening off. So we'll move on now to a second uh, theological speaker, <coughs> Mr. Lakhvir Singh Baji, and he's from the Sikh temple, 
and is our Sikh speaker today, and uh, he can speak until approximately up Five to minutes. seven. <coughs> then we can have a then we'll have a, a dinner. Thank you. I'm not close, but I'm not the expert at anything in the music. I'm an ordinary person, right? I'm just yeah, the ordinary people like you. Okay. We always say God is one. Every religion says God is one, right? I just want to know: before the creation, God exists all alone as miracle. Nirkun is a good word, which means it mean attributeless. In states of sarguni, means deep meditation, as says Guru Nanak Dev Ji, there was a darkness for countless years. Before the God create anything, there was dark, everything was dark. It's page on Guru Granth Sahib. 1035, Kunak said, There was neither earth nor sky, there was only its will. There was neither day nor night, neither sun nor moon, the God, but in deep meditation. Six believes that Vahiguru. What's Vahiguru? Vahiguru means wonderful God or Lord. Wonderful Lord and six beliefs is mean also it's most common term in the reference that God in modern Sikhism is Bahiguru. Sikh believes Bahiguru created the universe, the world and every life from within it. Sikh believes that before the universe exists there was only Bahiguru, only, only God. Vaheguru means, means every time I say Vaheguru, it means a God. And it was because of the will of God, or Hukum, that the universe was created. They believe in the once of creation, that Vaheguru created the world and is part of this creation. He sustained the world and responsible for everything in it. Therefore, Sikhs believe that they have the duty to respect and protect the world. There are only creation stories, there's no, sorry, there's no creation stories in Sikhism. Unlike in other religions, for example, Christianity teaches, teaches the story of Adam and Eve according to scientists theory of the Big Bang. Six believes that universe was created approximately 15 billion years ago. Because the Guru Granth Sahib explores that nature of the Vaheguru's creation rather than the re origin of the universe. Many Sikh accept scientific theories of the creation of the world. In Guru Granth Sahib, Page 1399 said, God established the earth, the sky and the air, the water of the ocean, fire and food. He created the moon, the stars and the sun, night and the days, and mountain. He believed the trees with the flowers and fruits. He created the gods, human beings and the seven seeds of establish in the three worlds. All the three worlds is life in the ocean, <coughs> number two on the land, and third is uh -huh. I think it possesses all the qualities and uh, <coughs> something like that. But, uh, he possesses all the, co all the qualities. Six also believes the Vaheguru is Sargam, Sargam in imminent. And so everything in the universe has Vaheguru's presence in it. This means that Vaheguru cares for his creation. The universe and everything in it. Everything 
that changes and happens in the world is because of Wahiguru's hukum. Hukum is when Guru Mukhi word is mere order, by God's word order. This shows six that Wahiguru loves his creation and unable him to reveal himself to human being. Wahiguru is a part of them in the form of the divine spark. The six gurus have described God in numerous ways in their hymns, including in the Guru Granth Sahib, the Holy Spirit of Sikhism. But the oneness of the formless God is constantly emphasized through God. The six symbols, Ikkamgar, often use the symbol of God Sikhism. God is described in, in the Mool Mantra, in the Guru Granth Sahib, in the Guru Granth Sahib, first page, Guru Nanak Sahib written in there, Ikkyamka, Satnam, Kartapra, Nirbho, Nirvair, Kalmur, Yunusavan, Guru Prashad. It means there is only one God and it is called the Truth. It exists in all creation and, is, and it is, has no fear, it doesn't hate and it's, it is timeless, universal and self-existent. You will come to know it through the grace of the Guru. And also it's written in page number 611, Guru Nanak says, Ek pita, hai. Guru hai means brotherhood. It means in English, the, God, the one God is the father of all. We are his children. Guru Ramdas says in his Sri Guru Granth Sahib, Vaho, Vaho, Satguru, Narankar, Hai, Jis Antan Parava, meaning this Lord descends, descends in this world in the form of the Satguru, but only some of their soul devotees is able to recognize him. And then, when there was a, our 10th prophet, Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, went to the heaven and he told the six, and now it's your Guru 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 Gurudan Sahib. And he written there, Agya Pai Ekal Ki, Agya Pai Ekal Ki, Chalo Chayo Panth, Sakshi Ko Hukum Hai Guru Manyo Granth. Guru Granth Ji Manyo Prakash Guru Ki De, Jo Prab Ko Mil, Chal Kajo Shabd Guru Sahib Me Le. Sorry, I'm reading wrong because it's it. Jo Prab Ko Mil Ko Khoj Hai, Khoj Shabd Me Le, Raj Karega Khalsa, Aki Rehna Koye. It's translation in English, under order of the immortal being, the Panth was created, all six are enjoyed accept of Guru Granth Sahib as their Guru. Consider the Guru Granth Sahib as an emodian of the Gurus. Those who want to meet with God can find Him, it's, in, it's, himself, it's Hims. The pure Khalsa shall be ruled and the impure will be left no more. Those separated will unite and all the devotees of the Gurus shall be saved. Thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we invite now our third uh, theological speaker, Mike Stannard. He's a major in the Salvation Army, and he's a Christian speaker. Let's warmly welcome him to you. Thank you for your welcome and also again for your invitation to, to be here with you today. Um, the Salvation Army is not known amongst the Christian circles a bit as being the great theologians. That's usually uh, other parts of the, of the Christian faith that tend to uh, portray themselves as being the, um, uh, the great thinkers of, of Christian thought and theologians. We're more people that like to roll our sleeves up. We have a personal faith and we like to try and express that faith in, in practical ways and in loving and caring ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important aspect of whatever we believe in God, whatever God we believe in, 
affects the way in which you, you live your life. If you believe in an angry God, you probably have angry ways of uh, responding to that. If you believe in a loving and caring God, supposedly you would have a, a loving and caring response. That's, that's the way it is perceived. And when I was preparing for today, I was um, reminded of some research that was done recently. And I want to share this research with you because it links in with what we believe about God. And it was saying here, this is particularly in the Western world, okay? Many people in the Western, particularly Western Europe, say that they believe in God. But in Europe today, believing in God does not necessarily mean that you believe in the biblical God. It means that they believe in some kind of power, some kind of energy, some kind of, um, of, some kind of deity that has um, some creational powers and has some influence upon um, why we exist and why the whole material matter exists. So it gets very, um, very diluted from how we, of those that believe belong to the major faiths, perceive God. It, it's almost like people are inventing their own version of what they believe God is because it's more comfortable to fit in with your own version of God than in with the biblical version of God or the um, um, uh, any other uh, major faith's version of God. So they, uh, it's tailor-made. It's almost like it suits the consumer mind. I'm going to choose something that fits me uh, and I can get rid of the bits that, that I don't like, that require some kind of responsibility or some kind of accountability. Uh, and that's what the modern mind doesn't like to do. It doesn't like to be held accountable. And so that, that, um, that research sort of helps sums up this idea that whatever we believe about God or we don't believe about God obviously affects the way in which you, you live your life. Um, John, I loved what you said at the beginning as you were stood up and you said, I'm talking about something that I'm not so sure about. And I can fully appreciate that because I think those of us that are on our faith journey, the more you know, the more you understand that you don't know. You understand what I mean? The more that you think you know and the more that you think you can grasp about God, the more that you understand how so little we really know. And it's a simple little illustration. I think basically we believe we have a lot more in common with each other from the different faiths than we do with people who have no faith. And I can remember this was about, I don't know, 30 years ago. I was living in Leicester and um, I was a Salvation Army pastor in the small, uh, small, tiny little church. It was one of the first churches of the Salvation Army that I was in charge of. And um, obviously there's a, a huge Asian population in, in, in Leicester. And um, our little core was sort of surrounded <laughs> by all these people from um, uh, different faiths. And the it was Christmas time, or it was building up towards Christmas time, and the local shops always play Christmas music. You go into Marks and Spencers, or you go into Tesco's, and you hear the, the music playing, and of course they're playing Christian Christmas carols. And then I heard on the news that several of the big shops had announced that they were no longer going to play Christmas carols in their shops because they felt that it insulted people of other faiths. And then there was a radio program that was discussing this issue. And there was, um, I think it was a person from, a, from an Islamic faith, from um, a Muslim, he stepped forward and telephoned the radio station and he said, I have more in common with somebody who's got a faith and I have no problem with the Christians singing their Christmas carols. In fact, I rejoice that there are actually some Christians or some English people who actually have a faith. And that was, that was, that was what he was saying. He was, because when you think about it, somebody who has another faith has a thought about himself that, is not, that he's not the central thing about his life. 
that if you have a faith, you believe in something bigger than yourself. And I think it was you again, John, that was talking about how the ego is the one that gets in the way. That we, we get in the way ourselves and, and it stops us from uh, actually, we, we say in, in, in our own faith, in Christian faith, that we submit ourselves to, to God, that we, you, you know, that we humble ourselves, that we are meek, we know our need for God, rather than being so arrogant and so big in ourselves that we think that we can um, be gods ourselves on this earth, even though Genesis does say that um, we were created in the image of God, or gods, depending on how you, how you interpret it. So I, I think that, I, I think for us, that's, that's a foundation of what we're understanding about God is that, that we believe in something that is bigger than ourselves. Whether you want to call it something, or someone, or some energy, or some power, I, we can argue about that. It, it doesn't really matter. It's a nonsensical argument, because like John says, it's difficult to comprehend. And like our, my, my Sikh brother was saying, that, um, you, what was it you called him? The big man. The big man. The big man. I, I the think big man. The big bang. bang. Oh, the big bang, yeah. as in as in the explosion. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to put a personality in a big bang, isn't it? Because that that's a chemical reaction or a, a matter of material colliding with other material. It's difficult to to explain. But from the Christian perspective, we speak about a God of creation, and you've all spoken about that yourselves about a God of creation, uh, and that some kind of power, some kind of intelligence, has made that happen. Now, in, and I would, I would think it is with other faiths. In the Christian faith, you've got those who are the fundamentalists, those that believe that the, the world was made, made in six days. I think somebody here said, well, was it you that was 15 billion years or something? Yeah. And it's not a figure I've heard of before, but it's an interesting figure. Whether that's scientific or not, it doesn't really bother me. Whether it's six days or 15 billion years, I think the central thing for, for people of faith is that it was created. It was created by God. Whether you call God Allah, or whether you call him Jesus Christ, or whether you call him whatever, it doesn't really matter. That's the important thing. People of faith have more in common with each other than people who have no faith. And I was, um, earlier on, when the prayers first started, we... We, I think it was in your speech, and I just sat there and I, I just enjoyed the male voice singing the prayers. We have that in, in the Christian church as well, male voices singing prayers. Sometimes the, the priest will sing, um, sing the mass, and there's a beautiful sound to it. And I, it was just making me think when the gentleman left to go in the prayers and the, and the ladies left a, a few moments ago to go, go to the prayers, how we have this beauty in all of our faiths when we begin to worship. The beauty of singing praises and singing our prayers to God. Doesn't matter what faith you come on, there's a beauty you come from, there's a beauty in being involved in that. And it, it does lift you up from your earthly existence. There is another um, plane on which you find yourself when, when you are praying and you are worshipping. And music helps with that. Music has a spirituality to it, a tone to it that just helps you escape the earth, even if it's only for a few minutes. And I thought, here we are, people of faith, and we have that beauty, yet at the same time, we do monstrous things to each other. You know, that, that faith that that motivates us to a higher level, that somehow we corrupt that. And I look at my own history, my own faith's history, and the things that we have done in the name of our faith to other peoples or even to each other. Even the Catholics against the Protestants. Or how, how does that happen? How does that, how does that exist? How does that come out? It shows the duality of a human being. <coughs> that we can praise and worship God and escape the, the wor worldly physical confines that we are, we are born to live within. And we can in, in, in receive that beauty 
yet we can go off and we can do awful, atrocious things to each other. And I, like I said at the very beginning of my talk, what we believe about God shapes how we behave. So when we're behaving incredibly evilly and incredibly wickedly, what is it that we believe about God that we think that somehow that that is acceptable? Whether it's me beating my wife, or whether it's me abusing a child, or whether it's me stealing from the company I work from, or whether it's me doing atrocious actions against another faith, because I believe my God is saying that I should do this. I don't know. There's something wrong there. Somehow we have corrupted it. Mm -hmm. And I, that brings me to this, this slide here. God of creation. Those that weren't here earlier on, John spoke first, and he was talking about how God, the concept of God, the essence of God, is unknowable. It is so vast, it is incomprehensible to our minds as to what kind of intelligence or what kind of um, uh, directing power can create a universe. We, we, we don't comprehend that. And how do we, if we believe in a God that is only like this in our limited understanding, and forgive me, we have to use symbols, we have to use illustrations, because they are the vehicles that carry forward ideas that are inexpressible. How do you express who God is without using symbols? without using words, without using personalities to show something of what God's nature is. So you've got the God of creation. If, is there a clicker? No, um, do you want me to do oh, could, could, you, could you be the chief button yeah. pusher? Yeah. Thank you. So... Uh, did you want me to close the lights so you can see? No, 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 yeah, it's, no. it's okay. I think yeah. it, we can, you can all see that that's a universe, can't you? Yeah. Yeah? Right. yeah? Not all of it, just a little bit of it. So... We have what, in the Christian faith, we talk about a personal God. Because the concept of God is so great and so vast, and the ideas of who he is, or she, even if we put a sexual term to it, it's just a symbol, because it's, it represents some aspect of our understanding of creation and the, the creating power that is, that is there. So we, we have to use these words. And in today's day and age, they don't like the idea of calling God using a, a patriarchal figure or even a matriarchal figure. They like it just to be God um, because uh, it causes barriers if you, give it, if you give God masculine features or if you give God feminine features. Barriers come up all over the place. How can God be a woman? Or, you, you know, or how can God be a man? Because then it cuts out half the population. So there's all sorts of arguments about that that become nonsensical. So we have a per no, no, not ready to change yet. So we have a personal God, a God that we can comprehend, a God that we can grasp, even though this personal God is still far greater than, than we are. And in the Christian faith, obviously, we have the Christ figure, the figure of Jesus Christ. And in our Christian doctrines, and again, doctrines are only vehicles to help carry forward a concept, to carry forward an idea that is just too difficult to be able to um, sum up in, in conversation. And so we have this idea that we can have a personal relationship with the God of creation. But because the God of creation is so great, we need to be able to focus in on an aspect of God that helps us to grow and helps us to understand and helps us to be able to um, receive that those values into our into our lives. So we have the personality of God the Father, the Creator, and we have the personality of God the Son, Jesus Christ. And so we have in that illustration again, it's an illustration to help us understand something that is, that is too deep to express in a, in a coherent way that would cover all facets. So we believe in Jesus Christ as the, as the Son of God. And again, when we say the Son of God, <laughs> okay, we, we have a story about Mary who gave birth to Jesus, just like any other woman, or most other women, 
can give birth to a baby. But again, it's a story that helps carry a spiritual truth, a spiritual understanding of spiritual values. That God re knows what it is like to be man. So how does the, the creator God, the one that's created all the stars and all, all the matter in the universe, how does he understand what it is like to be me? And for me to be able to comprehend who he is. What do I need to be able to... Um, I think again, John, you spoke about the divide, the, the distance between me and God. Mm. That the, the further away we, we are from God, you suggested we were in hell. Mm. And again, the word hell and the word heaven are only illustrative things to help us understand that there is a difference between being closer to the source of our life and further away from the source of our life, in the sense of not a physical distance, but a distance in, in, in spirituality, a distance in how much we are prepared to allow God have an effect on our life, or how much we are prepared to put a barrier up and be, be um, separated from Him. So in the Salvation Army, we have a number of doctrines, and these are a number of beliefs that help put into a nutshell um, what we believe, and then we have to adapt those principles and values into our lives so that we can live a life that we believe is pleasing to God. And it doesn't say anything in there that we should be attacking other faiths. It doesn't say anything in there that we should be doing anything against somebody else who doesn't believe in the same way we do. So we have our values. We believe there is only one God who is infinitely perfect, the creator makes the universe, the preserver, he keeps it all going and working, doing all the juggling, whatever he needs to do to keep the universe going, and the governor of all things. <coughs> governor means he's in charge, he's, it's his creation, and who is the only object of religious worship. We don't worship cars, we don't worship the prime minister, we don't worship the king, we worship only God. That's who we worship. The next one, there's 11 altogether, but don't worry, I'm not going through all 11. I'm not trying to turn you all into mini salvationists. We believe there are three persons in the Godhead. Now, this, this is not from, from the Christian perspective. Somebody from outside Christianity might think, well, well, do you believe in one God or do you believe in three? Make your mind up. It's not three separate people, as in me, you, and the lady over there. This is... It's a bit like water, ice, and, um, um, steam. Uh, and steam. It's the same thing, but it's different aspects of it. And this is, this is how we try to describe it in the Christian faith, is that you have the Creator Father, you have the personality of Jesus Christ to help us unify ourselves with God, because he's an understandable character that speaks about love and reconciliation. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is our spiritual guide. Somebody, um, uh, an aspect of God that is personalized to you and helps you understand and gives you the power and the, um, the guidance that you need to be able to move forward in your spiritual development to become closer to God that in that respect, that you will eventually go to heaven when, when, when you die. And again, those are all symbols. We've got no idea what heaven looks like. I mean, there's lots of artists that have tried to illustrate it. We've got no idea what hell looks like. We've had artists that try to illustrate it, but they're all trying to just um, help move forward the, um, the concepts of something that is healthy, something that is of God and something that is unhealthy, something that is wicked and evil that we should keep away from. I think that was the last one. This is the last one. This is the last one. Yeah. It all starts with the same sentence, so I wasn't sure. We believe in the person of Jesus Christ, the divine and human natures are united. In some respects, he's no different to you and I. In that respect, you're a human being. Yeah, you're made of flesh and bone and blood and lots of other gory bits, yeah? But you've got a heart, and when I say a heart, I'm talking about a soul. There is you inside this fleshy envelope. The real you is inside there. And that's no different to Christ in that respect. There was a fleshy moment, 
and I think perhaps um, <laughs> other faiths have some other feelings uh, and other um, uh, similar concepts that at one stage a prophet or, or a personality that was inspired by divine knowledge and divine power, that there was a fleshy moment, but inside that fleshy person was the real spirit of God, which is far greater than anything of the material nature. So I think I'm coming towards the end, just to um, make sure that I have come to the end and you can continue with your other speakers. I think it's important that I started to speak about how in Western society a lot of people believe in God. The majority do not believe in the biblical God. They have their own invention of what they believe God, God is. And maybe there's some truth in that, because at some stage, whenever the Bible was written, whenever the Pentateuch was written, whenever any of the Holy Scriptures were written, it was a group of people who actually agreed with each other's ideas and they put it onto a piece of paper, guided by what we believed was the Spirit of God, or guided by our, our faith. And so maybe there will be some truth in some of these homemade versions that we haven't quite grasped in the, um, the um, recognised faiths, the recognised religions. And so I think, like I started with, I think we, from our different faiths, have more in common with each other. And that makes us brothers and sisters, because we're fellow human beings. But it also, by the same principle, makes even non-believers our brothers and sisters. And therefore we should treat each other with respect, particularly in this world and some of the things that are going on at the moment. We forget that. It's not pleasing to God. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your contribution. And uh, now we'll, we will move on to our fourth and last but not least speaker, Sister Sidrani. She is the secretary of our Havering Interfaith Forum and a Muslim chaplain and teacher. Sidra has studied in uh, has studied Allah's 99 attributes in detail and is currently running a series of lectures on each name which can be found on her YouTube channel. Thank you very much. So welcome to our next speaker. The topic today is my faith perspective on God and I am going to give you the perspective of a Muslim. And in Islam we call God Allah. <coughs> and I'm going to talk to you all about Almighty Allah. Okay, that's my alliteration. And in Islam, we cannot be Muslim until we actually believe in God. And there are actually seven articles of faith. They are called um, the Imani Mufassal. And the very first one is, we believe in Allah. Okay? So we cannot be a Muslim unless we believe in Him. We also believe in His angels. We believe in all the prophets which he sent. We believe in all of Allah's revealed books. We have to believe in the Day of Judgment. We have to believe that everything good and bad is from Allah. And we also believe in life after death. Those are our um, seven beliefs. And um, the word Allah, did you know why we call him Allah is that we believe that is the original name for God. So, Alleluia is something that a lot of Christians would have heard of, the word Alleluia. Alleluia is an Aramaic word and it means praise be to God, doesn't it? Yes? And who said Alleluia, Mike? I do, quite often. Right. <laughs> Jesus, but I don't, yeah, yes. Jesus said Alleluia, which means he must have referred to the same God. Because uh, Alleluia is an Aramaic word from which Arabic came. And... Uh, a Jewish person will tell you that they call God Elohim. Eloh is Allah and Him is a suffix which is there to um, elevate somebody. So it's a little bit like when we say Abba Ji or Allah Ji or Jan at the end of a word. 
that is actually a suffix that elevates somebody. So the word Elohim, we believe, is actually Allah. And the word Elohim, when we spell it in Arabic, is actually, uh, sorry, in Hebrew, is very similar to the way we spelt it there. And we, so we believe Allah is the same God with Jews and Christians worship. In the film uh, Passion of Christ, which is made in Hebrew, um, Jesus is actually referring to God as Allah, which is just so amazing. Now that word, the way it's written in Arabic, is very prominent in Islamic houses. So we would find decorations like this. So this is actually from my house. You can tell because it's all glitzy, isn't it? <laughs> like me. <laughs> you can tell that straight out of my mantelpiece. Um, and you will often find the centerpiece saying Allah with attributes of Allah around it, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. This has actually got the 99 attributes around it, which one of my friends brought back for me when she went on holiday. And here is another one with Allah right in the middle. That basically shows we're Muslim, if you see that in anybody's house. Some of us may wear a necklace saying Allah, just like a Christian would wear a cross as a necklace. Right, so where does Allah live? <laughs> Come on everybody, where does Allah live? In, the heavens. in your heart. <laughs> where does he actually live, literally? Yes. On the throne. On the throne, and where is that throne? Above the seven heavens. Good. So last time when we spoke about creation, we said Allah created seven heavens. The highest heaven, Jannatul Firdos, is the highest heaven. And he lives on Jannatul Firdos is a massive tree. And it's called Sidra, <laughs> Sidratul Muntaha. And that's actually me. Did you know that uh, my mum named me after that tree? It's the tree of utmost beauty and it's really colourful. Now, why do you think I'm wearing colourful clothes? I'm always wearing colourful clothes. They say that what you're named after is what you actually do become eventually. So he lives above the seventh heaven. Above the se on the seventh heaven is a tree. And above that tree, Sidratul Muntaha, is his throne. So he lives above all of that. That's where he lives. Uh, you asked me about my dress earlier on. It's a sky. Why is it a sky? Because it's linked with Allah. That's where he lives up there. Okay? Um, now, what does he look like? Does anybody know according to Islam? Do we know what he looks like? Okay. Yes. He's pure spirit. You know, no, words. how does he actually look like literally? I think he's a light. He's a light. Mm -hmm. We know that for sure. Because we know that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he went up to meet Allah, <laughs> up on the seventh heaven. And he couldn't even bear to look. He looked away. There was so much light coming. Okay? So it says no vision can grasp him, but his grasp is over all vision. He is above all comprehension, yet is acquainted with all things. That's actually straight out of the Quran. So we cannot see Allah now and here, because did you know we are trapped in a time zone of time and space, and he is beyond that. So we cannot see him, unless Allah wants to show himself to somebody like a prophet. Okay? Does anybody know another prophet that actually asked, I want to see Allah. Moses. Moses. And he looked towards the mountain and the whole mountain crashed down in half and he became unconscious on the floor. And that was not even, you know, that was just like a little snapshot. So we've got this really lovely story of Moses who, who asked, I want to see you, Allah, show me. Show yourself to me. And, and he looked at the mountain and the whole mountain crashed down in front of his eyes. And he was so grasped by that image, he just fell flat on the floor, unconscious. So I find that quite I've amazing. I've not heard that story, but it's, it's in the Quran. Read the Quran, yeah. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read another Quran. version of it. But yeah, we, we do say in the Christian faith that Moses, um, when he came off the mountain, yes. that um, the glory of God was shining, shining on in his him. face. But yes. he was afraid, so he covered his face yes. so that the yes. people didn't see that glory disappear because Moses yes. was limited. Where we believe that as well. We, sp we believe God spoke to him through the burning bush. Yeah. Yes. 
Amazing. Right, in our last lecture on creation, we said that, that Allah alone is almighty and he is the creator and sustainer of the whole universe. We believe that with his right hand, he's got the whole universe going, including all the gravity and all the, um, you know, the circuits, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, all the gravitational fields and the anti-clockwise motion in everything is all being sustained by his right hand. Amazing. That much we do know as well. The only way to really get to know Allah is to learn about his attributes. So he has 99 attributes which are actually descriptions of him. And uh, those 99 names are part, from, are part of Imani Mujmal, which is a statement of faith. Muslims explain, we believe in all the names of Allah and his attributes. Those attributes help us to recognize Allah. So, for example, there may be things like the most knowledgeable, the most merciful, the most forgiving. Um, I mean, I've been actually doing a whole series of these, which Brother Tariq just mentioned. I'm going to do a series of lectures where every month I cover two names. And last time we did the unlocker, didn't we? The, the person who unlocks, because he can unlock at any stage anybody and they can then come towards the religion and, and, and open their hearts towards God. So those are very, very important. We have to believe in them. And did you know that we can actually mimic those attributes and become better people? And they say that if you learn those 99 attributes and learn their descriptions and implement them in your lives, then you go to heaven. Because that makes a perfect person if you try and mimic it. To a certain level, we definitely can't be like Allah, can we? But we can implement some of those attributes into our lives. For example, we can be merciful towards the poor. And we can be um, forgiving as well, can't we? Um, and the giver of food, we can give food to the homeless and things like that. All of those things we can mimic. Because of those wonderful 99 attributes, that makes Allah completely unique, which means nobody else can be like him. So we only, only believe in one God. And Tawheed is the name of the oneness of God that is actually exclusive to the Islamic faith. The top sentence is our very first pillar of Islam, which is the Shahada, the testimony of faith. The first part is there's only one God. So if we don't believe that there's only one God or we associate partners with him, that breaks that shahada in half and that means we're not Muslim anymore, basically. That's how strict I would say our religion is. So we believe that Allah has no son or partner. He is just one on his own. And this is actually the concept of Tawheed, which is special to Islam. The belief in Allah, one, to single out Allah alone and believe that he is the only true Allah worthy of worship. He is the true and only Lord of everything. He is unique in his divine names, attributes and actions. Because he is one on his own and completely unique, it is only him, only, that we pray to. So none has the right to be worshipped but him alone. And we worship him directly, without any mediums in between, without going through people, without going through saints, we will worship him directly. Um, and the people before Islam came in Arabia, they had completely forgotten about God. So when Islam came, we were told to start remembering God. And to remember God, then we need to pray. And we actually remember God five times a day, so that we're remembering him the whole day, not just in the morning and forgetting about him. So prayers are said five times a day, and they are a direct link between us and God. These are the times, and we believe that Souls need prayer. Our souls need prayer. How many people out there have got money? They've got clothes, they've got houses, but they're depressed. Why are they 
very depressed because their connection with their religion is not there. They haven't quite grasped that connection with God. So we believe stomachs need food, cars may need fuel, but your souls, they need prayer. You will never be satisfied in life without that true connection with God. And to achieve that, then you need to connect with Him through prayer. So there's my big bottle of um, pills, healthy pills, medicine. By the remembrance of Allah, hearts are assured. And you feel uh, satisfaction in your life and peace. Other things, all that is in the heavens and earth magnify him. He has power over all things. And we believe that everything on the earth and up is actually worshipping God and going round in an anti-clockwise motion. Because anybody think of anything that goes around in an anti-clockwise motion? Let's think of science first. Any scientists over here? The water down the drain goes anti-clockwise. Does it? It goes across the equator. Yes, okay. it does. Because of the gravity. Brilliant. Anything else? What's the smallest part you can get in science? Come on, scientists. Hey, Giles, you're a scientist. Electrons. Electrons, ions. Did you know? Look at the motion. It's going that way. Electrons, ions. Okay, all of that stuff. Did you know your circulatory system in your body goes which way? Anti-clockwise. Anti Anti-clockwise. thought about that? You throw a sycamore leaf down, which way does it go? Anti-clockwise, like a helicopter. Okay? So we believe that everything, <coughs> all that is in the heavens and the earth, magnify him. He has power over all things. Is, is that work, that, that, that's illustrating the bird is worshipping? Yes, if down. you put the Quran on, did you know lots of animals, they start bowing down, and I'll tell you one of them is a goat or a sheep before you sacrifice them. Did you know when you put the Quran on, they submit to, they, they actually do submit, come and kill me, <laughs> kind of thing. Okay, so again, birds, we've got those birds, think, look at the birds, they're going to be migrating soon into other lands, warmer countries, and they're going around anti-clockwise. Mosquitoes as well, around a light. They're annoying, but watch them go around. I find that absolutely fascinating. Right, he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing, and the all-knowing. He knows what's in your hearts. If you've committed to sin, he knows. So he is watchful over everything in the world. He can hear you, he can see you, everything. Okay, um, and we believe that he knows what has happened, what will happen, and how it will happen as well. Nothing happens in the whole universe except by his will, and we believe that all good and bad is from Allah. So we strongly believe in destiny. If we do not believe in destiny, we're not Muslim. So do you know what? That makes us incredibly patient people. So if we're ill, we know it's from God. If we're being tested, we know it's from God. If we're getting over bereavement, we know that's okay. Um, this is what Allah meant to be for that person. But it can be very, very hard. But we pray to God to make things better. So for example, my dad is ill at the moment. And I will pray to God, because no one else is going to make him better. Only God. It's only God I can cry to that God, please make him better. No one else can make him better. No doctors, no nurses, no hospitals. It's up to God. If God wants him to stay alive, he will. Okay, and then the Quran has got... Allah's words in it. So we believe that the Quran, which is the word of God, is the, uh, Allah is the author of that Quran. So he gives us guidelines on how to live, what we need to do to get better, what we need to do to, you know, get up to heaven, the sins that we need to stop, stop doing this, do a little bit more of this, do a little bit more of this. All the guidelines are actually in the Quran, so we believe that Allah is the author of the Quran. And when we read that, it's like he's talking to us. It's absolutely amazing. We read that, and it's like he is talking to us. 
And sometimes, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I, uh, I went to a conference in Birmingham. It shook me up, that conference, just because there was a man and he was talking about a bookcase falling down. He was writing something really bad. And the bookcase fell down and the Quran fell on top of him. And he opened the Quran and he opened up on a verse. So we believe that sometimes when you're in difficulty, you open up the Quran and, and you think, oh my God, is that God talking to me or what? It's like the exact verse comes out that you need. And you've never seen it before in your life. Yet you've read the Quran many, many times. Things like that. We do believe that on the day of judgment, we will come across God. And he will then judge us. He will weigh up our scales, the good and the bad deeds, and he will judge us on what we've been doing in this world. So if we've been doing worldly things, you can give me some worldly things which there's no real benefits to. Houses. Big houses. Posh cars. Posh cars. Posh cars, money. Holidays. Holidays. Holidays where there's no benefit as in it's not pilgrimage. Yeah? Holidays. Shopping. Jewelry. What did you get out of shopping? Okay. What did you say? Jewelry. Jewelry. Shopping. Shopping for anything. Okay. But what did you do for God? Interfaith forums. Lectures. Read the Quran. The dream. What else did you do for Allah? Pray. Pray. Give, charity. Give to charity. charity. Do your pilgrimage. Okay. Give, um, feed the homeless. Mm -hmm. Voluntary work out there. What are you doing for the voluntary work? That's what's going to topple your skills. So we believe Allah's going to judge on the day of judgment and He will then decide where you are going to go. And then, if your uh, good deeds are toppled down, then did you know you will meet Allah in paradise? So it says believers will see Him in paradise. The vision will be as clear and certain as seeing the moon on the night when it is full and the sun on a cloudless day. So that's actually a very strong hadith of um, our prophet, one of his sayings. So we are all actually on this world to work for this day when we will live eternally and we will meet our Lord. Okay, so that's all we know really about Allah. Uh, that was a very basic... Um, talk but obviously the real in-depth now you can ask me for the Q&A which we are going to do next. Thank you very much. We, the speakers have all spoken so it's time to ask questions. You can choose your speaker and please keep your questions on the topic of the concept of God please. Any questions? Yes, first hand up I see is Namayan, then I'll come to you with the Namayan. Okay, um, I'll ask you to them. Okay. The fact of the matter is this, uh, when it comes to scriptures from uh, various religions, okay, people, uh, people from different faiths, they read the book, they do the prayers, it's all blessing everything, but when you, uh, when you read something like, well, the world was created in six or seven days, okay, the fact that they're not understanding the knowledge, okay? The book, the scripture book is not just there for you to worship God, pray and everything, but it's also for you to perhaps, I don't know, if you're not uh, a science expert, to analyze it, to understand it, what it's saying, yes. okay? Isn't that uh, what people should be studying as well, as a second? Yes, yes, definitely. So, you will get Muslims, I, I will admit, yes, you get Muslims who pray five times a day and they give money to charity, but that's rituals, that's what we have to do. So they do it, but without the connection with Allah and without understanding why are you doing all of this, why are you doing it, the real connection isn't there. So yes, that's why you get all these uh, bad people out there who are called so-called Muslims, they're not really practicing Muslims, and then they do bad out there, because they haven't really understood the religion. They may be praying five times a day, giving their charity, but they haven't understood the religion. To really understand the religion, you have to look at the explanation of the Quran, you have to look at the background on why were those verses revealed, um, and in what context were they revealed. 
until you understand what context they were revealed in, you can misconstrue anything. Okay, so it's very, very important to understand for the children as well nowadays, the youth. There is no point in reading the Quran parrot fashion Arabic because you're not going to understand what's in it. And I've had many children, I used to actually work here in this school, you know this as chairman, I used to work in this school. The children learned their Quran parrot fashion Arabic and then they left. Their Islamic studies was missing. And then a couple of years down the line, you get the parents ringing me, my son's on drugs, my son's doing this, my son's doing that. And then you think, well, do they know that it's wrong? No, because my son never read the Quran in English. They only read it in Arabic without understanding it. So the best way is once you finish the Quran in Arabic, understand what is it actually saying in your mother tongue. The explanation is so important. It really is. Okay? The next question from Brother Ben. So my, my question is this, that obviously you understand there's a Muslim uh, perspective. Regarding that thing, the believing in certain things, and one is like the destiny, and like the, okay, good things, that's fine. But the bad things, like after five days, one person will kill five people, and that's, Allah knows. Yes. So can you please clarify that? Are you talking about terrorism? No, no any, anything, anything bad which happens. Okay. So basically, if Allah knows, why that cannot be prevented? Okay. Somebody does because fight. it's a test, isn't it? Everybody mm. is tested in their lives. Yeah. And uh, it's a test. You know the knowledge. Are you going to do bad? Okay. We also believe in Satan, Shaitan mm. as well. That crops up people as well. Um, so we are always tested. We're tested with our knowledge all the time. You know, even Imams are tested, are they not, with their knowledge? They know everything, but they, they are going to get tested. And if you pass that test, then that's really good because God will elevate you up a heaven, up the stages. Um, and if you don't pass the test, then obviously you're accumulating sin. It's a test. But also Satan whispers, we believe, in our religion to people and makes them do bad. But knowledge of the religion is important. So if you know, for example, killing one person is not killing the whole of mankind, then you know you're not going to do that, are you? If you I, don't know that. I think there's another aspect to it. Yes. And sorry to interrupt there. Okay. But I, I think it, um, we have uh, the understanding of free, free will. Yes. Anything of value has to be chosen. You have to choose it. You can't make your children love you. They, at some stage, they have to take that within themselves, that they, they love you and that you love God. And going back to the, the first question where, where you were asking your question and you were, you, you were responding, it's, it's not just about knowledge. Knowledge is a big part of it, but knowledge means nothing if it's without love. Mm -hmm. love. Love is the motivator, love is the expression. So you recognize that God loves you and when you respond to love, you respond to that in a positive way with love. You don't respond to love with hate. No, of course not. But the thing is, uh, at the end of the day, say for example in your scripture, the world was created in six days, yeah? Okay, and the Quran basically, Mr. Nain was saying basically the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. The point being is, at the end of the day, right, I've seen basically imams, pastors, whatever, they preach from the book, yeah? But the thing is, you've got to understand it, that you have the scripture that is part of your yeah. faith, yeah? yeah? Well, the world in six days, yeah? Everybody should question it. Yes, it was created, and then, or well, it was created in various stages over thousands of years and millions of years. And Mrs. Name has already given that statement in the past, basically, when she yeah. does a lecture. Okay? Yeah. But the thing is to understand what it's saying, not just to read it and believe oh, no, it. Yes, uh, we all yes, do that. Uh, I, I fully accept what Cedra said. Is, is that uh, you have to go beyond? You have to go beyond parrot fashion, um, and you also have to go beyond knowledge. Knowledge uh, is, is another level. Yes. But that has to, at some stage, become love. It's got to be. It's got to turn in. Knowledge has got to turn into love, because I think that when you love God and when you love Prophet Muhammad peace be upon you, you automatically want to please. You want to. Yes, do because that's, that's the natural response. Yeah, yeah. 
you want to please your husband, you love him, you, he loves you, you want to love your children, you, mm -hmm. they want to love you back and they do things to please you. Yes, you do things to please God, not to gain a benefit from it, because, but because it's an automatic expression of love. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be an automatic ex uh, uh, expression, uh, uh, not just a... Naturally. Yes. Well. Na a natural not response, yeah. not, not for, and that goes back to free will. You have to choose the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that we do, where, whether it's the sin of looking at another woman in a way that you shouldn't be, or whether it is stealing from the bank, or whether it's killing somebody, you are in, mm -hmm. you're in control. Yeah. You, you make the decision, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can choose not to, or you can choose to do what you believe God is saying. And I think as well you must... Um, the fact that God knows what's going to happen doesn't mean that he causes it. If I'm here, looking down, and I see a car racing along a narrow road, another car racing along, I say, they're going to crash, and they crash. Well, I didn't cause it. I didn't do that. I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't do it. So I do not, I do not for example, believe that Judas was set up to betray Christ. That was his choice. God knew he was going to do it, but it was not God who made him do it. Otherwise, it's not fair on Judas, is it? But you, you touched on something earlier on, that God is beyond time and space. Mm, yes. yeah. and, and when you're talking about destiny, as humans, we tend to think of time in a linear sense. So yeah. you choose to do a bad thing. Why did you do that bad mm. thing? Why didn't God stop it? Mm. You know, even Christians say, well, why didn't God stop what happened the other day? Mm. Why didn't he stop it? Well, he's outside of that, so we see it as a time, we see it as an action or actions that we've done in the past mm. as part of history. But God sees it as a glo uh, uh, outside of that. Uh, and so if that accident is going to lead to something else, and that will lead on to something else, it's all part of the mixing pot mm. that God is somehow um, involved in. Mm. So the, the idea of cause and effect doesn't really matter because he's beyond that. And we are not pieces of a puzzle to be moved around a chessboard, but we choose. And if we're not choosing the right way, then we will continue to do the wrong things. Hmm. Yeah, that philosophy is quite right. And uh, obviously everybody is responsible for uh, his or her deeds. And that's the basically choices have been given as well. That how, what you choose, what you select. But then there are like uh, natural disasters. Like, it's like God knows that in 1945, the World War, Second World War happened, and so many yeah. million people will be killed. But okay. like, but those are, those are the, the limitations of the material world. And that was not a natural disaster, that was human perversity. Oh, the war. Volcanic, yeah. volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and natural disasters. Yeah, but again, coming to that, that God knows that by this, by this earthquake, yeah. maybe. But one 10, of the thousand thing, people will be die. Yeah. So why, 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 why he didn't want to prevent it? I think that would be a, that would be a, that would be damning if it wasn't for the fact that we have a life beyond this one. Scientifically yeah. speaking, if I may add a little bit, uh, volcanoes and tsunamis they create the change that they they displace ground and land and the. Uh, the continents are moving away and the, once upon a time all the land was one piece so so scientifically they create a rift between mm. land mm. yeah that scientific uh, uh, understanding is fine yes but if the god is so powerful why he does not stop to prevent that human disaster i, I think like john said because in our faiths we all believe in an afterlife. Yeah. The afterlife is the one of greatest value. Mm. The life presently is of a lower value in that respect. Mm. It doesn't mean to say it is of no value, but the greater value is the life after death. Mm. And okay, you may be saved by the, you know, from the volcano. A ship comes along and takes you off the island, or you might, uh, you might have cancer and God may have healed you of it. But you're going to die anyway. Mm. You're going to be hit by a bus or, mm. or just die in your bed. You, you know, the, those are mini miracles. The greatest miracle is, is, is eternal life, mm. is, is the everlasting life. That's where the real value of our life here mm. now is, is for us to attain the, um, uh, the, the, the afterlife, to attain mm. that, 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 that yeah. level. 
if you want to call it a level, it might just be a natural extension yeah, of I anyway. the other understanding of taking your point further ahead to the sister, like in our Islam we believe like the people who died by earthquake or things like that or got buried with natural disasters and all that, they are basically automatically go to the heaven, isn't it? Yeah, oh you're asking me. Is that yes. a question? Yeah, yes. I mean, yes. Like that is that that uh, sort of justify the thing. Yes, for example, during COVID, when people died of COVID, they yeah. said that they would just go to heaven without any sin. And, yeah. But at the end of the day, we still believe it's up to God and He will judge. Yeah, he's because it could bad. be somebody who was a murderer, for example, yes. uh, and then died. You know, yes. and, and it doesn't a mean drug, it's a drug died of COVID. Yeah. yeah you, you know. So uh, we still believe that God will still judge, though. Yeah. Still, it depends, you see, what the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole talks about in my calamity is my providence. And you should ask Sidra to tell you about the Surah of the Cave. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Surah that's, God, that yes. shows that that's a messenger of God. I said, and the servant of God doing all kinds of things that look tyrannical. Yes. And then when it's explained why, it all becomes very justified. Yes, yes. Okay. So, quickly. I think there's another brother who wants got a question. Yes. Can yes. you either select your speaker or ask the question? Kevin, no more than one chief speaker, yeah? Uh, you can ask one question, and if there's anybody else who's got a question, we'll come back to you. Okay. So, uh, I will ask John. So, basically, uh, from the discussion, what, what I, what I uh, uh, had as a conclusion is uncertainty. Uh, so, I heard lots of uh, uh, uncertainty when speaking about God, lots of ifs. And what if? And so my question is: From where did we draw, or do we draw our explanation of what is God, or what is religion, uh, or what is good and what is evil? We are not certain. We get our explanations from the religions we join, and all the religions have gone through the past as well. So uh, the, the expects notion of what is God comes through Judaism, through Christianity, through Islam, through the Baha'i faith. We look at the writings that explains it to us. We can't do it on our own. Um, on our own we'd be lost without the manifestations of God to guide us. So if we are not certain about that, so how can we be uh, sure of what we are uh, following or uh, as a religion is something worthy of following? Well, if, you're not, if you don't, if you don't read, if you don't read what the manifestations of God say, you've got a problem. It's because you're going direct. It's, it's not something you can do. All we know about God comes through the, the manifestations of God and the religions that come from God. Um, otherwise, we're sort of in on our own, and that's exceedingly difficult. Any fresh questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go back to Brother Noah. I just, I just have one last question. Um, can I ask both uh, John and Mrs. Nani? Okay. Um, the thing is, as you said, uh, we've been watched in this world to be prepared for the afterlife. Okay. None of us knows where we can end up. But the most terrifying situation, basically, is when it comes to extract the soul out of your body, the angel of death, and you're taking your last breath. Okay. Nobody knows what it looks like. It is, you know, it, it's being given power by God to take your soul out of your body exactly just that. When you get as a soul, uh, when you go back to him, when you, uh, you know, reach the realm of the dead, okay, I might practice basically then you will be questioning your grave, but then you're given a vision, bro, this is what you did in your life, this is what you learned, and that's God directly saying to you, this is where you're going, okay. Does that basically mean, once you're told that, it's all over, forget about the day of judgment, you, okay. you are going. In Islam, it's not the end. Because we have a special thing called Sadhgajariya, which means ongoing, you get blessings into the Day of Judgment. So you may be destined to go to hell, and you see the hell vision in your grave, but then your children are doing things for you. Or maybe the people who you taught are carrying on the legacy of what you taught them. So you are then going to carry on getting those blessings until the Day of Judgment. And the man is the Day of Judgment, you will be surprised. It says this actually in the Hadiths, 
God will say you're going heaven. And that person says, how did that happen? I was destined to go to hellfire. And God will say, you know your child, they prayed for you constantly, and now you're going to heaven. So that, that is not the end, you know. That's why it's so important to do Sadhkajariya, which is this ongoing um, blessings until the day of judgment. Little deeds that you need to do, plant your seeds now, so that once you're gone, then the, those deeds will keep multiplying and then you can reach a high station. But I'll tell you one thing which Muslims do a lot. They don't do anything in this world, okay, and then they think, doesn't matter, my children will do it for me when I die. They don't even do Hajj, for example. Well, with the children of nowadays, do you think they're going to bother? Very different world we're living in. Um, and why rely on that? Why take that risk? That actually worries me. Why take that risk? Why not do it yourself? before you go up, so you've got a, got something to show to God. So don't wait for anybody else to do anything for you. It's only you and your deeds that are going to go up, nobody else's. They can't take away your deeds, they can't give you deeds. So you need to do what you need to do and take those up with you. Don't rely on anybody else. Whereas the Baha'i writing says, it is clear and evident that all men shall, after their physical death, estimate the worth of their deeds and realise all that their hands have wrought, so your soul is judging you. I swear by the day star that shineth upon the horizon of divine power, they that are the followers of the one true God shall, the moment they depart out of this life, experience such joy and gladness as it would be impossible to describe, while they that live in error shall be seized with such fear and trembling and should be filled with such consternation as nothing can exceed. So the moment we depart this life, we are aware of what we've done, what we've achieved. And uh, as I say, if we've done the right things, we, it's all well, and otherwise we're going to be remote from God. But it's, it's not... Uh, um, and uh, well, we have a different meaning of the Day of Judgment, but that, that can be a future topic. Mm. Actually, let's do that as another topic. Mm. Yeah, it's good idea. <coughs> Any more questions from the audience? Actually, just a follow-on to uh, the previous question and the response yes. of the sister. Actually, I would rather um, I would rather suggest uh, for the for the children who is learning Quran or for anyone who is learning Quran is instead of uh, after uh, memorizing Quran going for the English translation or going for the mother tongue yes. it's actually better to learn, learn Arabic, Arabic mm -hmm. of yeah, course. because yes. many, actually many scholars they suggest when you want to understand a philosophy mm -hmm. or uh, an article or a research done by, by uh, some scholar uh, some ideas and meanings will be lost in the translation yes, of yes, the words definitely. because some concepts mm -hmm. are, are uh, just simply not uh, easy to translate or untranslated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if madrasas started doing Arabic language because there are words in the Arabic language which you cannot even you know, denote for another word. It just doesn't exist. I wonder if that want to say about calamities. Um, and Andrew Baha, the son of Baha, was in America. A lady came and she said she, she, she had a daughter that had died at birth. And she said she had this dream. And this dream, this lovely little girl was running around a beautiful garden and ran up and smiled at her. And Andrew Baha said, that was your daughter in the next world. Sometimes the divine gardener has to replant. Um, and that's what happens. And you get all kinds of things, like my father was killed seven months before I was born, I didn't know him. When I went on pilgrimage, I dreamt of him, and he was smiling. It was a wonderful experience. Yes. Okay. I've got a question for Lakhwe Bhaji. Uh, I heard this uh, about Vahi Guru Satna. Can you translate that for me to explain to me that? Vahi Guru I hear that. But I don't understand. Wah God. Wah God. Praise of God. Yes. And 
That's a, it's a, we simple say that thing. So it's praise of God. Yeah. Praise of God, you know. God is a massive, you can't explain to him. He's a Lord, is God, whatever we say. You know. That's why we, when Gunanak Dev he went to the river three days, people said he's a drain, right? Mm -hmm. And actually he went to see, meet the God. And God gave the word to Vahiguru, go outside, teach the word Vahiguru to the world. Mm -hmm. That's happened, Vahiguru came from there, you know, and he praises the Vahiguru, Vahiguru, while well, Vah Lord, Vah Lord. Yes. Satna? Satna means truth. Truth. Satna Every, means truth. Yeah, everything truth. Okay. Paramatma truth hai. Thank you for explaining yeah. that. Yeah. If there's no more questions, we will conclude. So, thank you. So, it's been an interactive evening. Thank you to everybody for attending, and special to strong, warm thank you to our speakers for their contributions and keeping us updated on the topic. Um, so, on Monday, the 13th of November, that's a date for your diary, is the next interfaith event, which will be the interfaith quiz night <coughs> at the Salvation Army at 8 p.m. So that will be Monday 13th of November, interfaith quiz night at the Salvation Army. And it's interfaith week that uh, week. So a final thank you to our speakers and audience for participation and thank you all for coming.